we get where it started, of course, and uh, we're continuing our study of these theological terms. If you know, we started off and we looked at the Bible as a whole and we looked at God and then we looked at man and the fall. And then we're looking at what the section we're calling salvation. And let me just do this. We'll just move this up. This lesson, this little section is God's plan of salvation. And tonight, expiation, regeneration, and justification. We saw some things. If you, you don't have to turn back, but we started off with reconciliation. And then we looked at the term sin. And we looked at the term spiritual death. Then we went to redemption. And then last week, we looked at atonement. And before we get really into more of that, let's review for just a second. And we, we understand that we we got to have a grasp of understanding God's plan. We realize, first of all, that God has a plan to save mankind. If we, we go all the way back to Adam and Eve and the fall where man sinned, God promised the seed of woman would crush the head of the serpent and the seed of Abraham would come and the whole world would be blessed and the son of David and then all the way up. And we saw all that. So God has this plan to save mankind. And when we think about it, it's called reconciliation. And that's that's the story of the Bible. That's why I love it. I love it when you say, what exactly is the Bible all about? And it's how God brings man to himself and he uses his son Jesus Christ. That's actually the story of the Bible, and that's what reconciliation is. We all know that the problem is that, that we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is what? It's death. I mean, that's that's the problem. And and so how do we deal with this? And I've got right there that death is what? Death is separation from God at physically and spiritually. I almost, when, when the Bible says, for all the sin and come short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death, we realize that we come into the world spiritually dead. And if something that and eventually most of us, most everybody, unless Jesus comes and takes us out, is going to die physically. And so there's there's the death, and that all comes back to sin. So death is separation. Death is uh, both physically and spiritually. We the, the thing that we talked about when Jesus died on the cross, and we said that when did he pay for sin? The aspect of spiritual death happened when he was separated from the Father, when he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then he died physically and rose again to conquer physical death. So Jesus on the cross did actually both. He he died spiritually and paid for sin, and he rose from the grave so to defeat to defeat uh, the physical death aspect. So that's all right there. So we're looking at tonight at a at a bunch of terms, really, at some really unique terms. One of the terms is the word expiation. And when you think about it, it sounds like a big term, but all it means is substitution. And I think one of the key things in the Bible is to realize that Jesus took our place. Now, what do we owe God? We, the wages of sin is what? Death. And we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so we owe God death. That's what, that's what the deal is. And so God, what, what happened is God said, well, you, you know, you're supposed to die. Because the wages of sin is death, and I'm a righteous God, and so there's got to be death. And so what did Jesus Christ do? He took our place. And so the definition of expiation is the payment of a penalty or the suffering of a punishment for another. That's what it really is. So you can write that down under definition there. It's the payment of a penalty or the suffering of a punishment for another. That's what it is. And if you want to write in that little blank there, you can put Jesus Christ became our substitute, our expiation. Now, I, this is a silly story. I've, I've made this up, and I, I've told it at different times, so you've heard it before. But here's a good picture of that. Uh, I'm in the sixth grade. It's raining. We don't get to go out for recess, so the teacher let us play a racer tag. And in my day, you actually had erasers and erased the boards. And so we had you had a racer tag. You'd put the racer on your head, somebody else put the racer on their head, and one of them was hit, and you had to go catch them. And if you could touch them before your racer fell off, or if their racer fell off, you won. And so we played, and then it was over. The teacher said, everybody put the racers up, and let's get back for stuff. And of course, uh, people are starting to throw the racers. And she said, well, okay, that's it. If I see another person throwing a racer, I'm going to give them three licks, because in my day, they could give you a spanking. And, and, and just so happens that she turned her back, I'm throwing, and she looks, and she says, J.B., Okay, up here, three licks. And I went, I don't want three licks. And she said, yeah, I'm going to give you three licks. Because I said that if anybody threw an eraser, what were they going to get? Three licks. Well, I have this best friend. His name is Carl. And Carl says, I'll take them for him. And she says, what? She said, I'll take them for him. She said, you know what? I don't care. I said, there's got to be three licks. If you want to take the licks for JB, you can. So he comes up. He gets the three licks. Now, that's not a true story. But the bottom line is what? He became my what? My substitute. He took, I'm supposed to get three licks, and my friend took the three licks for me. We're supposed to what? 
to die and be separated from God forever. And what did Jesus Christ do? He came and took our place. Jesus became our expiation, our uh, substitute. Let's think about some verses just for a second. How about Romans 5 eight? God demonstrates his love toward us that while we're yet sinners, what does it say? Christ, what? Died for us. Now I want you to think about that. Christ died for us. He took the penalty of sin. The wages of sin is death. Look at this one right here. First three to three eighteen. Christ, the just, died for the unjust. Christ, the just one, died for the unjust. I think I put it up over here. Yeah. Christ died for our sin, the just, for the unjust. When you think about it that way, who's the just one? Jesus. Who's the unjust? Us. Christ died for us. The Hebrews 2.9. Now just write these out. I don't have them out here, but I want you to just write down Hebrews 2.9. Just write the verses. Hebrews 2.9 said that he tasted death for what? Every person. How about 1 John 2.2? He's the satisfactory payment not for our sins only, but for the sins of the entire world. He's the satisfactory payment for everyone. Listen to this right here. You'll love this. We've, we've gone over it before, but... It's uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 4, 5, and 6. It says, God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. If there's one God and one mediator also between God and men is the man Christ Jesus. Now listen to this. Who gave himself as a ransom, as a payment for all. Not for some, but for all. So those are just a few verses that I wanted you to see, and I gave you some extra ones there, that Jesus Christ died for us, paying for our sins, the just for the unjust. Look at this right here. It, you know, why? Well, of course, it said he died for our sins, the just for the unjust. Why? That he might bring us to God. That's reconciliation. I mean, that's the bottom line of 1 Peter 3.18. Christ died for our sins, the just for the unjust, having been put to this, that he might, he might do this. He might bring us to God. And then here is something that's amazing. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. Galatians 3.13. What is the curse of the law? Have you thought about it? What's the curse of the law? That it says, do, let's just say it's a hundred things. Now, we know there's more than that. There's a hundred things. What's the curse of the law? You can't do the hundred things. You can't keep it. So the law says, do these hundred things, you can't do it. And so the law, the bottom line says, if you sin, you what? You die. So the curse of the law is that we couldn't keep it. We couldn't do it. So Jesus Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law because the wages of sin is death, and Jesus Christ died for us. So expiation is taking the penalty for someone else. It's a very simple term of substitution. And do not forget this. Do not, do not forget how that God took our place. Now, when you look through religions of the world and pagan things and all that, nowhere is there that, that God would be the substitute. The greatest message of all is that God loved us God gave Son to die in our place as our substitute. And we're thankful because, let me tell you, that, that Jesus Christ did it all. And, and without him, we have absolutely nothing. And he is our substitute. So that's the first one. You got it? This lesson is not a real long lesson. And I just, let me just through this way also, the college people are going to be coming in here as soon as, as we get out. So I just want you to, uh, I, I want you to have time to ask any questions, talk about anything. But these words are so powerful. So substitution. Aren't you glad Jesus took your place? I read a story and it, it broke my heart. And I could read it. I, I have it. It's actually almost two pages, so I won't go to that. But it was in, it was in, uh, during the Holocaust and it was a concentration camp, and it was a, really a death camp. And they had lined all the people up, and the, somebody had escaped or tried to escape, and they killed them. And then they lined them all up, and they said, because someone tried to escape, we killed them, then we're going to kill another one. And they just walked over, and they grabbed this guy, and they pulled him forward and said, now we're going to kill this guy. And he started weeping, and all of a sudden... Somebody stepped out of line, which nobody did, and it was an old man, and he had been a priest, and he walked forward, and it said people were just stunned, and they thought, how come they hadn't beaten him up yet? And he walked to the front, and he said, I would like to take his place. I'm old. You don't need me. He's young. You can use him. Let me die in his place. And the German soldier went, okay, shot him right there, killed him. That guy made it, the guy that didn't get killed, made it through. 
and went to his hometown and found some of his family. And there's a memorial in their yard saying, this man took my place and saved my life. I read the story. If I read the story, I'll cry because it's amazing. Think about what we owe God. None of us measure up at all. And God says, the wages of sin is death, the soul of sin shall die. I'm a righteous, holy, perfect God. There's going to have to be death. And Jesus said, I'll die in their place. I'll be separated in their place. I have, there are people who will say things like that. Jesus wasn't separated from God. Jesus wasn't separated from the Father. What do you think, my God, my God, why have you what? Forsaken me. What do you think that means? They were having a picnic? No, I think he was separated because the wages of sin is what? Death and death is separation. So never, never forget it. Never forget that Jesus Christ died in our place, paying for our sins, being the, the one that, was, uh, that took our place. With that in mind, let's go to the next word. And the next word, well, I've got these down here. I think I've got a few things for you. Christ became a curse for us. He took our place on the cross. He redeemed us from the curse of the law. Let me go back, and that, that's it. So that's, think about it. He became the curse for us. He took our place on the cross. He redeemed us from the curse. I always think of Barabbas, and we talked about it that Sunday morning when we did it, and here's Barabbas in the jail cell waiting to be put to death because he had committed murder in the rebellion. He was a robber. He was a bad man, and they came and opened the door, and he's expecting them to take him out to be crucified, and they say, you're free to go. Why? Because somebody else took your place. Jesus took his place. Somebody else took our place. Jesus took our place. With that in mind, let's go to the next word. And this is one of my favorite words. It's regeneration. Regeneration. And let me give you, let's think about a definition. The definition of regeneration. And I want you to put it this way. I want you to think of it this way. It is the act in which God gives spiritual life to the believer. And it's being called being born again. That's another term for regeneration. It means being born again. And so I want you to think about it. So if I put, said, give me the definition of regeneration, I want you to put the act in which God gives spiritual life to the one who believes or to the believer. That's what I want you to see. Because we're dead in trespasses and sins. Now, we've seen this before, but let me just draw this up here, okay? And so this is, this is Adam. He has a body, a soul, and a spirit. Adam and Eve, what God gave them the body, the soul related to the world around them, that's the mind, the emotion, the will, the spirit related to God. And he put them in the garden. That's, man, they, they, you know, their body, they're a trinity. Human beings are trinities, body, soul, spirit. And so what happened? They sinned, and when they sinned, he said, in the day that you eat from that fruit, what will happen? Dying you shall surely die. It's a dual die. The first die is spiritually. Dying, you'll die. So dying spiritually, you'll die physically. And that's what happened. They died immediately. They were spiritually dead. And the result of sin and spiritual death is ultimately physical death. It took them 900 years. It doesn't take us that long anymore. We're good at dying faster, right? They live longer, different things. But the bottom line is now... Would you look at a person? They have <coughs> a body, a soul, a conscience, because he said, now that you know right from wrong, and this was, we have a flesh, which is what we call the bent to sin. It's called the old man. It's called sin within us. And so we, this is a person. We come into this world, and guess what? We're physically alive, but we are what? Spiritually dead. And that's why in Ephesians, he says, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. It says later on, he says, we were dead and he made us alive. So what happens the moment we believe in Jesus Christ? Because remember, we say regeneration is being born again, born a second time. And the word for again in the Greek is ana, and it can mean again or it can mean above. And so you could say you're born again, you're born from above. It's a spiritual birth. So the moment you believe, you, this, you have a spirit. And I always just write it as the human spirit. I could have put a human spirit over here. This is the part of you that is now alive, spiritually alive. You were spiritually dead. Now you're spiritually alive. You can know God. See, over here, 
Well, before this happens, you can't, you, we can't really know God. We can think about him. We can reach for him. As the Bible actually says, we, 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 we have our move and being, and he's all around us, and we might search for him, as he says in the book of Acts. But the bottom line is we can't really know him. And when we trust in Jesus Christ as Savior, we're, well, we've got eternal life, and we become alive. Regeneration. And, of course, for us in, in the church age, the Holy Spirit actually comes to live inside of us as well. And, and so it's just an amazing thing. That's why there's the battle between the flesh and the spirit. But now we are spiritually alive. So regeneration is the act in which God gives spiritual life to the one who what? Believes. You believe and then you are what? Born again. Remember that Calvinism, the tulip, Reformed theology teaches the opposite. They teach that God regenerates you and makes you believe. We believe that you believe and then you are regenerated. Okay? So let's see something that is... Uh, let me ask you a question. <clears throat> when you think about being born again and you hear things about being born again, do you, th do you think that's an Old Testament or New Testament? Huh? It, it, so, so it happened in the Old Testament. Is it also New Testament? I mean, right now, if anybody that we know trusts in Christ, are they born again? A lot of people think that the being born again is a New Testament concept. Where is the most famous passage in the Bible dealing about being born again? Do you know? It's John, let's turn. Let's turn to it. It's John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Is John chapter 3 Old Testament or New Testament? Is John chapter 3 Old Testament or New Testament? Huh? It's found in our New Testament, but it's actually what? Old Testament. When does the New Testament begin? At the death of Jesus Christ. So actually almost all of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all are Old Testament books. So in John chapter 3, probably the most famous passage on being born again is, is actually Old Testament. Because Jesus is teaching it, and he hadn't died yet. The New Testament hadn't started yet. So let's talk about it. We said that uh, regeneration is an act in which God gives spiritual life to one who believes. Okay? And so we are physically alive, but spiritually dead. And so in John, and, and, and God makes us spiritually alive, and it's by faith. And we're going to talk more about that. So let's look at John 3, and let's look at it. And G let me just give you a little background. Jesus has started his ministry. Uh, let me just throw some questions out. How old was Jesus when he began his ministry? How old? 30 years old. He was 30 because when did the priests start their ministry? At 30 years old. Isn't that amazing? He's a great high priest. He started his ministry at age 30 years old. We saw him when he was 12. We saw him when he was born. We saw him when he was about a year old, maybe two years old. Then we saw him when he was 12. And now we see him when he's 30 years old and he begins his ministry. And so he started the ministry and he goes back and forth and up and down. He's mostly, almost all the time, he's in the northern part of Israel. Sometimes he comes to the southern part of Israel. He's in the southern part of Israel and he comes to Jerusalem and he does some signs. He does some miracles. We already know way back up in Canaan and Galilee, he's already changed the water to wine. He's done different things. He's healed people. He'll go into the synagogue he'll go into a place and some guy had a bad arm and he'll just say something and the guy stretch out his arm and then it's, it's healed and some guy was at the pool you know Bethesda and he was laying there for 30 something years and Jesus said you want to get well and the guy goes yeah I don't have anybody to put me in the water he said just get up your thing and walk and he got up and walked I mean so people know that he's doing these miracles so we're going to meet a man and you remember that what did the religious leaders say about Jesus they loved him no, they didn't love him. Why? Why didn't they love him? He's what? They thought he was blasphemy, and they, they, they thought he was going to take their positions away, and they were jealous of him, and they saw that people hung on his words, and he taught his one having what? Authority. And so they didn't teach that way. And, and so when he came, people were just flocking to him, and there was all these rumors that he was the Messiah, and he was the Savior, and some people would worship him, and he didn't say, oh, don't worship me, I'm just a man. He said, thank you very much. I mean, he, he was getting worshipped. I mean, so he, they, they, he's claiming to be God, and so they're really mad. And so early on, the religious leaders, they don't trust him at all. And we're going to meet a religious leader. His name is Nicodemus, 
and he comes to Jesus. So let's look at John chapter 3, verse 1, and look at what it says. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. When you look at one little bitty verse like that, there's so much in there. There was this man. His, he was a Pharisee. What, were, what is a Pharisee? You know, you can write that. What is a Pharisee? They were, they were a religious sect, a religious group. They were the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Herodians, the, uh, the, the Zealots. They were all different kind of groups. The Pharisees were the largest group, and they held to the Bible. They were very legalistic. They started off by saying, we, we're going to hold to the Bible. And it was great, but they added so many rules and everything to it that by the time you get up to Jesus, it, it's nothing but rules and regulations. And they're just, they're legalistic. They're bad legalistic. And, and then there's the Sadducees, which were a little bit more liberal. They held more to the first five books, but that's about all they held to. They didn't believe in angels or resurrection. And most of the priests were Sadducees. That's why we like to say that's why they were sad, you see, because they didn't hold to resurrection or anything like that. And so the Pharisees were, they started off good, and now they become just legalistic. And we're going to meet this Pharisee. It says there was a man uh, of the Pharisees named Nicodemus who was a ruler of the Jews. Now, the ruler of the Jews is a what? Anybody know what that is? That's called the what? The Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was made up of 70 men. High priest was one of them. And there were 70 men, and they were the ruling body of Israel. So this man that's coming to Jesus is a religious leader, and he's in the Sanhedrin. And that means he's got a lot of power, and he's coming to Jesus. Now, let me ask you a question. If he's like all the other religious leaders, what does he think of Jesus? He's not going to like him, but he's not like everybody else. I think he's actually open. So watch what happens. So it says, This man came to Jesus by night, and he said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher. For no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. Now, he comes. Uh, by the way, the religious, a Pharisee is a religious leader, legalistic, held to the law of Moses. Uh, the, what, what is, verse 2, what does he say about Jesus? What does he call Jesus? What does he call him? Rabbi. rabbi. That, is, that is, he didn't have to call him rabbi. Rabbi means my teacher. And so he, act, or, or my master, actually. And so he actually said to Jesus in a nice way, he said, Rabbi, and so he's being nice to Jesus, let's put it that way. And then he says, we know that you have come from God as a teacher. Now, he didn't say he's the Messiah. He didn't say, I believe you're the Messiah. He didn't say any of that. He said, you must be from God as a teacher. Why? Because for no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. Now, he recognizes that Jesus is doing things and they must be from God. Now, what did many of the religious leaders say when Jesus would do a miracle? What would they say of where did that power come from? The devil, right? Okay, so he's not the same as them. They would say Jesus is from the devil. He says, Jesus, you must be from God because you're doing these things. Now, you would expect possibly for Jesus to say, well, thank you very much. It's about time one of you guys recognize that. But Jesus doesn't say that at all. Jesus doesn't say thank you. He doesn't say anything. He goes right to verse 3 and says, Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus says you must be born from where? Above. Again. You must be born again. That's regeneration. That's being made spiritually alive. Jesus says, unless you're made spiritually alive, what happens? You cannot see the kingdom of God. You won't get to go. You won't get to go. Jesus, Jesus, he calls Jesus rabbi. Jesus was doing signs. He says, what? He says, you must be born again. What does born again mean? What does that mean? It means to be made what? Spiritually alive. Every one of us in this room, let's just say this. Every one of us in this room trusted Jesus Christ. Am I right? So every one of us have been born again. Every one of us are spiritually alive. We were dead before you trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. You were not spiritually alive. 
You were spiritually dead. You were dead in trespasses and sins. Now we're alive. Jesus looks at this man named Nicodemus, and instead of saying, thank you for the compliment, he says, let me just tell you something truly, truly. Amen, amen. This is a truth. Unless one is born from above, once one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You won't be in the kingdom of God. Now remember, we say things like, I hope I go to heaven. Jews never thought going to heaven. They thought of being in the what? The kingdom. And, and what are you going to be in? The kingdom. And, and listen, if we're going to be in heaven, it's going to be a short time. Because the, the plan is that Jews, Gentiles, and everybody comes together in the thousand-year reign of Christ. That's the kingdom. And then the eternal kingdom. So he says to Nicodemus, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. You can't do that. Nicodemus doesn't grasp it. Watch what he says. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Now, it's almost, a, almost funny that, uh, that, that he says, you, 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 you can't go back into your mother. Well, of course you can't go back into your mother. Jesus isn't talking about what? Physical birth. He's talking about spiritual birth. And Nicodemus doesn't grasp it. You know why? Why doesn't Nicodemus understand what's going on? Because the natural man can't understand the things of God. He's spiritually dead, and he doesn't have the Spirit of God. And let me tell you, he may know the Bible in the sense of knowing it, but having the comprehension. Listen, there are a lot of people who aren't Christians who know the Bible, who can say, well, I know this, I've read this before, I see how this. But they can't put it together. They can't grasp it all. They can't see how all these things actually work. And so he can't do that. Nicodemus should have understood. Because Jesus is going to say, you mean you're a teacher of Israel and you don't understand these things? He's saying, you've been teaching people? You know, that's one of the problems, is there are people out there who teach and they don't even understand what they're teaching. And, and some of the New Testament letters, they'll say that there are people out there teaching, trying to teach Scripture, but they don't, know what it's, well, they don't even know what it's saying, and they're trying to teach other people things. I mean, I've had people, I've watched people stand up and say, you know, if you can just get two or three people together, then God will hear us because he's not hearing us unless we get, and you want to go, do you know what you're saying? That's not even, that, the context of that passage is not even that. And then you're actually contradicting the fact that the Bible says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. What should you fear? So you mean he's not with you unless you have another person with you? I mean, think about what they're saying. And you want to say, why don't you just sit down? And, and let somebody else teach if you're going to teach that kind of thing. And so he looks at Nicodemus, and, and Nicodemus says, I, I, I don't understand because I don't think you can get back into your mother's womb. And, and look, look at Jesus. He goes right to it again in verse 5. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And so what does he mean, water and Spirit? What do you think he means, water and Spirit? Huh? Water by birth and spirit by so, so you're saying a physical birth and a spiritual birth. That's exactly what I think. I think that water refers to physical birth and spirit refers to spiritual birth. And Jesus is basically saying unless you're born physically and spiritually, what's going to happen? You cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, some people, and I've got this, and I just want to put this up here for you. Some people think that in Ezekiel 36, 25 and 26, it talks about that the Holy Spirit will wash you. And so he uses the word water there. He says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you'll be clean. I'll cleanse you from your filthiness. I'll give you a new heart and a new spirit. And I'll remove the heart. And some people think that when Jesus is saying, you got to be born of the water and the spirit, he's referring back to the, the passage of Ezekiel. I don't. I think Jesus is saying, and you don't have to write all this down, by the way. You can just write down Ezekiel 36, 25, 26, and go back and look at that at some other time. I think that when Jesus says water and the spirit, he's talking about about spiritual birth and physical birth. Watch, watch what the next verse says. Are y'all ready? Verse 6, you don't have to write all it. Don't write that whole verse down. Just look it up sometime. But look, look at this right here. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. That's verse 6. What is born of flesh? Physical birth. What's born of spirit? Spiritual birth. So when I think Jesus says you've got to be born of the water and the spirit, he's saying you've got to be born physically and spiritually. And he says, Nicodemus, you've got to be born again and Nicodemus doesn't he just doesn't grasp it and verse 7 Jesus says do not be amazed I say to you you must be born again and I think at the top of your other page it says notice the key statement found in 3335 and 37 what is that that is you have to be born again you have to be born from above 
the water and the spirit born again. Look at Nicodemus. Now I want you to think about this. Look at verse 9. Nicodemus says, how can these things be? Now, you think, Nicodemus, you should know this, right? Should he not know this? Look at the next verse. Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and you do not understand these things? Now, I want you to notice something. Uh, we, we, for years, we've all talked about when you, you know, observation, interpretation, application, how do you study the Bible? You observe it, and you look at everything. Look at this carefully. He didn't say, you're a teacher in Israel. He said, you are what? The teacher in Israel. He's talking to the top teacher in Jerusalem, most likely, maybe the whole country. And he says to him, and you don't understand these things. The truth is, unbelievers cannot grasp all this. Think about this. This, this. this. They have the body and the conscience and the flesh, but they don't have the human spirit to relate to God. They don't have the Holy Spirit to, to be inside. So they haven't got it. And so Nicodemus basically says, I, how can these things be? And Jesus said, you're the teacher in Israel and you don't understand. And so what does Jesus do? Jesus knows that Nicodemus has probably memorized because most Pharisees memorized the Torah. What is the Torah? That's the law, but what is it? It's the, it's the first five books. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Many Pharisees had memorized the first five books. Have you thought about that? I mean, somebody says, I'm going to memorize Philippians. That's going to take me forever. Well, Philippians is about that long compared to the law, right? I mean, think about it. That they'd memorized the law. They knew the Bible. Let me ask you something. They, did everybody have Bibles and carry them around and everything? No. In fact, many things they knew, they knew from memory because they had to memorize it all. And there were the scrolls at certain places and there were the scribes that wrote things down and everything. But the average person didn't carry around the Bible, didn't have the Bible. In fact, when they go to the synagogue, there was the, the, the thing there that they would unfold and then there is the scripture and they had their different reading parts. But the average person just didn't have the Bible. And so they memorized and memorized and memorized. So what Jesus is going to do He's going to do something that he knows Nicodemus will understand. Nicodemus knows the Bible, but he doesn't understand. So Jesus is going to take him someplace and help him understand what's going to happen. And so he's going to go back to verse, verses 14, 15, and 16. is talking about when Moses lifted up the serpent. That's Numbers 21. Now, we're not going to turn back there, but let me remind you what happened. Most of you know the story. The Jewish people, when they, they came out of Egypt, I mean, they parted the Red Sea, and they griped. They griped, and he parted the Red Sea. They got to the other side, and they griped, and he gave them water. Then they griped, and he gave them manna. Then they griped, and he gave them birds. And then they walked around for a while, and they finally got to the place of the law and uh, to the mountain and then Jesus went, uh, Moses went up on the mountain and came back down with the law and they griped about everything and they did everything and, and so then they, they were at a place called uh, Mount Sinai of course and it was an 11 day journey and they made an 11 day journey to Kadesh Barnea which is the very bottom of the land and they said now we're going to take the land. It, they stayed at Mount Horab, Mount Sinai for a year and so they've been out of Egypt for a little more than a year about almost a year and a half and they send spies into the land. They all come back. They're all upset. And they say, we can't take the land. And Joshua and Caleb say, yes, we can. And everybody else says, no. And so God says, okay, all right, you don't trust me. Everybody 20 years old and up, you're going to all die. Only the 19 down will get to go into the land. And so I'm going to let you wander around for 38 and a half more years, 40 years total. For every day you spied the land, you will wander in this wilderness until this whole generation of people die out. And when you die out, then your kids who you said, we don't want to take them in there because they'll get killed by the giants. They're going to get to go in and take the land because you didn't believe. And so instead of us going in now, it'll be about 38 and a half years from now. And so they wandered around for basically 40 years until they all died. But there was a time in Numbers, the book of Numbers, they're wandering around. And once again, what are they doing? They're griping. And so God allows snakes. I don't know, most of you know this story. Some of you may not. If you've never heard this story, you're going to actually love it. It's Numbers 21. Snakes begin to bite the people, and they were dying. And, of course, what do they do? As soon as something happens, they turn to God, and they ran to Moses, and they said, God, Moses, go tell God to do something. These snakes are biting us. 
So Moses actually says, okay. And so he tries to get with God, and God comes down. And Moses says, the snakes are biting everybody, and everybody's upset, and they're dying. And God says, so here's what you do. Take a, take a, a piece of bronze, make it look like a snake, put it on a pole, stick it up in the camp where they can see it. And here's what they do. Anybody that gets bit by a snake, all they have to do is look up there, and they won't die. It's called what? Faith. It's called looking up onto the one on the pole, and you'd be safe. And that's what happened. And that's Numbers 21. That's what happened. Then Nicodemus knew the story. So what does Jesus do, and what does he say to Nicodemus? Look at verse 14. He says to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man be lifted up. By the way, who is the Son of Man? That's Jesus, but that's, his ti- that's the title of the Messiah in the book of Daniel. Would Nicodemus know who the Son of Man is? Yes. He says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So all of a sudden, Nicodemus goes, wait a minute. You're saying as the serpent was lifted up and people looked up there, the Son of Man is going to be what? Lifted up. That whoever believes will in him have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will never perish but have everlasting life. So all of a sudden Nicodemus goes, wait a minute. So you're saying just like the serpent was lifted up and all they had to do is believe and they were saved, you're saying the Son of Man is lifted up and all we have to do is what? Look to him, believe, and we're what? We're saved. We're we're born again. We're going to get the guilt of the kingdom. That's basically what he says. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, Israel disobeyed. They were bitten by snakes. They asked God to help. He commanded them to look at to look up at the bronze snake and believing they would be healed. Whoever looks to Jesus will be healed. I love the verses where, where you can't stop at verse sixteen. He goes on to say to him, God didn't send the world into, into the, the son of the world to condemn the world, but the world would be saved through him. And whoever believes in him will not be judged, but whoever does doesn't believe is already judged because he has not what? He has not believed. I love this verse because people say, you know, because you're a sinner. I say, no, no, no. You're not, you, don't, you don't go to hell because you're a sinner. You go to hell because you don't believe. And he told Nicodemus this. He said, you must be born again. And look at this. As, as Moses did, so Jesus was lifted up. It's the Old Testament picture of salvation. And, and, you know, I, I don't think you can see it very well. But what, what, are the, how do the, what do the medical people use? They use a stick with a snake around it. That's, that's medical. Why do they do that? Where did they get that from? What healed those people in that day? Looking up to a pole with a snake on it. And that's what people use today. And so regeneration is, but God was rich in mercy because of his great love, which he loved us. We were dead in our transgressions. He did what? He made us alive together with Christ. It's by grace. It's by grace you have been saved. And so you don't have to write the whole verse down. Just write down Ephesians 2, 5, that he's made us alive together. And so regeneration is even when we were dead, God made us us alive. Second Corinthians five seventeen, therefore if any man be in Christ, he's a what? New creation. So not only uh, we think about this, not only has Jesus became our substitute, but he is the one lifted up to make us spiritually alive. Is that incredible? Do you love that? I mean think about that. And you can tell the story. Listen, I I got years ago uh, Dennis Casey, when he was a state legislator, he had me, I got to go, and for the whole week, I was the chaplain, uh, you know, and uh, on the, for the first four days, he just like Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, for, the, for Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, all you do is you pray, you open up the thing every, so I dr- drove down there every morning, got there, and got in there, my little prayer. but on Friday morning, you get to speak for five minutes. And I got up and I said, I'm going to tell you a story today. It's a verse that every one of you know. And yet, it deals with something that you may never have heard of. And most people don't know Numbers 21. And most people don't know that John 3.16, 3.14-16 goes back to Numbers 21. 
I said, I got to teach that that day at the, at the Capitol. And so don't ever take it for granted. This is one of the great stories in the Bible. Hey, could you imagine teaching somebody and saying, you know, when you see this, why did he say, as Moses lifted up the serpent? And then you could tell them the story about the snakes biting people and they had to look at it up on the pole. And, and, and so it's fantastic. Okay, we got one more, one more, and that's justification. And I want to make sure you grasp this, okay? And so we'll go into even more details next time. But justification is the act, write this one down now, the act by which God declares righteous the believing sinner. Now, I put it that way on purpose, Okay. Now, I want you to understand something. Justification does not make you righteous. It declares you righteous. And we'll talk more about it in just a minute, but that's what it is. Justification is to be declared righteous. Okay? And I want you to turn to Romans chapter 3. You've been in John 3, so turn over to Romans chapter 3, just a few pages on over to Romans chapter 3, and we want you to see justification. Romans chapter 3, and we'll start at verse 21. But by the way, can God overlook man's sin? No, because he's perfect and righteous. He's just. And if he did, he would not be God. So we're going to see Romans 3.21. And let's talk about justification. Let me erase something while you're turning over there and making sure you're in the right place and all that stuff. I want, I want to uh, teach you something just to briefly tonight. And next week, we get the real details on it. Okay? But let's talk about justification. And this is to be declared righteous. We'd say it'd be declared right. You're okay. You're right. It'd be like you stand before a judge. By the way, it's a legal term. You stand before the judge and he basically says, you're right. You're okay. You may have done it. You may have done wrong. Let me ask you a question. Have y'all done wrong? Has he declared you righteous? Okay, so... Being declared righteous is not the same as being made righteous. We'll talk more about it in a minute. So look at Romans 3.21. It says, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. In other words, God, God's righteousness has been made known. Now, let me ask you a question. God's righteousness is what? It's a big plus, right? It's perfect. What's our righteousness? Rags. Is that right? Is our righteousness plus righteousness or negative righteousness? Huh? Negative. It's negative righteousness. Yeah. Okay. He says, but apart from the law, the righteousness be, uh, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even watch, even the righteousness of God which comes through what? Faith in Jesus Christ. For all those who believe, for there is no distinction, there is a righteousness that comes by faith in Christ. Now watch what he goes on to say. He says, For we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I mean, we don't measure up, but... We're justified. What does justified mean? We're declared right. So re read it this way. Being declared righteous as a gift by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Do you see those words? Justification, redemption. All, these are words we've been looking at. In fact, if you look at the next verse, it says, whom God set forth publicly as a propitiation. Those are all those terms we got on that page that we need to understand. Look what he says. We're justified how? As a gift. We're justified freely by his grace, a gift that cost us nothing. It, for the price the, it, Christ paid was his life, but it is all simply by faith. We are justified by faith. God says, declares that we're right when we believe in Jesus Christ. When we trust in Christ, God says, I declare you right. Now, if you noticed in the next verse when it says, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation, 
That's a satisfactory payment. We'll talk more about that one later. And then we're going to see another word next week, which is imputation. And that makes you righteous. Okay, so let's stop for just a second. Let's talk about it. What is justification? It is to be what? Declared right. And so it's like this. Let's pretend that you sinned, right? And you come and stand before God. Are you a sinner? Yes or no? Yes. And so he says, when you believe in Jesus, I will declare you right. And we go, it sounds like a pretty good deal to me. And so I trusted in Jesus Christ, and I am justified by faith. And God says, you're righteous. Now, am I righteous? No, I'm declared righteous. Now, we're going to talk about because we do get his righteousness. That's called imputation. That's a different word. And so I just want you to understand how the Bible fits together. There's a lot of things there. And so when we get to Romans 3, 28, it says, we are declared righteous, justified by faith in Christ, not by works. Look at Romans 3, 28. For we maintain that a man is justified, declared righteous by faith, apart from the works of the law. Justification is the act by which God declares us righteous. Apart from our works. Apart from anything that we've done. And, and if you notice Galatians 2.16. I love Galatians 2.16. Look what this says. Nevertheless, knowing a man is not what? What is that word? We're not declared righteous by what? Are you declared righteous before God by your works? No. But through what? Faith in Christ. Jesus. Even... We have believed in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus so that we would be justified, how? By faith in Christ. And not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law, nobody can be what? Just, why can't you be justified by the law? Could, what? Can't keep it. So you're justified by faith, and you're declared righteous by faith. Now let me show you something, and we're going to see this next week. And then we have a break for Christmas. Justification. Declares. You. Righteous. Imputation. Makes. You. Righteous. We're studying this tonight. We're studying that next week. So when you see the word justification, look, listen, let me read it back to you again. The righteousness of God through faith in Christ for all those who believe. For we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified, declared righteous as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. We maintain that a man is justified, declared righteous by faith, apart from the works of the law. So, do you understand it? Okay, it's pretty neat stuff. We are declared righteous by faith in Christ, not works. Tonight, we have seen three more terms. We have seen expiation, which means a substitution. Jesus died in our place. We have seen regeneration, which to me means to make alive, be born from above, and that's to all who believe. And we've seen justification means to be declared righteous, and that happens the moment we believe. Now, let me say this. All of these things, expiation, justification, all of it, they all happen at exactly the same time. So when you believe in Jesus Christ, not only does he declare you righteous, he makes you righteous at the same time. We're just talking about them on two different nights. Okay? So verses that I think you want to know, first of all, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man is in what? In Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away, so you're born again. And then Galatians 2, 16. It's a little bit long, but it is fantastic. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Christ Jesus. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by the faith in Christ and Jesus, and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law no flesh can be what? Justified. You can't be justified by the law. So, great stuff. 